Okay, so Easter is coming, and we have invitations for you. We have a little flyer you can pick up as you leave today to start giving out. You know, there's a lot of people that want to go to church on Easter. And all you need to do is say, hey, what are you doing Easter? Would you like to come to church? The key, come. Come to church with me and bring them as your guests. We have a lot of services. The information is in this little flyer you can take with me, with you. And also, here's a little sticker. You can put it on your phone. You can put it on your car. You can put it wherever there is available space. I'll be carrying one right here, just like that. And we have a little sign. Uh, Taylor's holding the sign. So she's going to be Vanna White today. Here we go. So this is a lawn sign that you can put on your front yard. And then the other side is cool. See that? Okay. So you can put it in any way you want. Get a lawn sign. Get some of these. Let's Thank you, Taylor, very much. Good job. Okay. Well, we're in the Sermon on the Mount. The title of my message is Make a Difference. And our text is Matthew chapter five. Let's pray. Father, as we open your word, we want to give our attention with intention. We, we don't want to just hear it. We want to do it. Actually, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, you say, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, they're like a wise man who builds their house on the rock. But for the person who hears these sayings and does not do them, they're like a foolish man who builds their house on the sand. Lord, help us be wise men and women and build our lives on the rock of Christ himself and of the truth of Scripture. So speak to us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, the title is Make a Difference. Did you know that the biggest celebrities in America today are not movie stars, they're not rock stars, they're not TV stars, they're media stars, specifically social media stars. They're called influencers. Now, some social media people have a lot of followers, over 900 million. I looked it up to see who had the most followers. The number one person out there is Cristiano Ronaldo with 901 million followers. I didn't even know who he was. He's what they would call a footballer. We might call him a soccer player. And then there's uh, Lionel uh, Messi, and he has 496 followers. Selena Gomez, she has uh, 430 million followers. I've heard of her. Kyle Jenner, 399 million followers. Dwayne Johnson, The Rock, he has 395 million followers. followers. Ariana Grande has 380 million followers. Funny thing, I got an Ariana Grande at Starbucks this morning, and it was very good. <laughs> Um, and then Kim Kardashian has 364 million. Oh, is that all? You know, but that, that's a lot of followers. And, and because of this, a lot of young people today are thinking, now why would I want to go work over there when I could be an influencer and monetize my platform and make a living doing this? One study found that fortune and fame were the first and second goals of millennials. So what are your goals in life? Number one, fortune and fame. Number two, Fortune and fame, okay? One in four millennials would quit their jobs to become famous. One in six preferred fame to having children. One in 12 admitted they would disown their family to be famous. Uh, we're taking it a little too far here. But why do we have this desire to be famous? Why would we want a lot of followers? I think it's because deep down inside we want our lives to matter. We want significance. We want to be noticed. I don't think those are bad things, by the way. But let's just say for the sake of a point, you had 900 million followers on your Instagram page. What would you say to them? Well, I would post a photo of myself. Okay, what else? I'm, and my new outfit. Yeah, what else? I have some cool cat videos. Okay, really? <laughs> Listen to this. You are an influencer. You have a platform and you have a following. Now it could be on social media, but in your world you have a sphere of influence where you influence other people. So it really comes down to this. Are you a good or are you a bad influence? Here's what Jesus said 2,000 years ago that is very relevant to this topic of influencing others. Matthew 5, starting in verse 13, he says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? 
It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people put a lamp uh, and get a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine to others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. We'll stop there. Salt and light. Why did Jesus use these two word pictures? Answer, because the world is a dark and corrupt place and it needs salt and it needs light. You know, despite all of our advances in every field from science and medicine and education and technology, we just go from bad to worse. Matter, modern man has just found more ways to corrupt and destroy himself. We go from war to greater war, from crime to greater crime, from immorality to greater immorality, from perversion to greater perversion. We're just playing out the truth of this scripture that says the heart is deceitfully wicked above all things who can know it. You know, if you believe that man is basically good, you're gonna be very disappointed in life. But once you accept the biblical premise that man is not basically good, man, and when I speak of man, I'm speaking of all humanity, we are sinners separated from God, and we have made things worse. Okay, so you say, you're right, Greg, the whole world's going to hell in a handbasket, so let's isolate ourselves. Let's start a Christian city, and we'll live in Christian houses and eat in Christian restaurants and drive Christian cars and have Christian dogs and Christian cats. Maybe not Christian cats, but, <laughs> but actually, <laughs> I would not agree with that idea because the fact of the matter is our job is not to remove ourselves completely from culture, but to influence it, bringing me to point number two, something that think that they can evade the culture through isolation. You know, you try to remove yourselves and your children from our culture, but your culture will find you. And so I think we need to do everything we can to prepare ourselves and our children to live in the real world as followers of Jesus Christ. Sometimes Christian parents die on the wrong hills. And by that I mean they major on minors and miss the big picture. I heard our son Jonathan say recently when he was speaking that he had a lot of friends that went to Christian school and many of them have fallen away from the Lord. And he said, but I also know that many of them were really restricted. Their parents wouldn't let them listen to secular movies. They wouldn't let them watch uh, secular music, wouldn't let them watch movies. Uh, they couldn't watch cartoons unless it was Veggie Tales. And uh, so it's very restrictive. And he says, oh, my dad would drive me to school and we'd listen to the Beatles and the Doors and he would watch the Simpsons with me. And I'm thinking, wait a second, is this good? Uh, was I actually a horrible parent? Now, I'm not advocating you watch The Simpsons. Uh, there are things on it that I, I wouldn't agree with, but here's my point. I don't like Veggie Tales. You know, I liked other cartoons, and, and I liked The Beatles, and I didn't like a lot of the music that we were supposed to be listening to, but I wanted to prepare him for the real world, and I would take these opportunities as teaching moments. So if we're watching a cartoon or a movie or whatever it is, and there's something there that's contrary to what we believe as Christians, I'll talk about that to him. You know, Moses said the way to teach our children is when you get up in the morning, when you walk in the way, and when you go to sleep at night. So more than just a set time of having devotions with your kids, you use what happens in life as examples to teach them how to live and walk and think and behave as a follower of Jesus Christ. And so our idea is to infiltrate culture. I read an interview with a very well-known pop star. She said she was raised in a legalistic Christian home. Her parents banned all secular music and they couldn't even use phrases like deviled eggs and dirt devil, that's a vacuum cleaner, by the way. And, and she was restricted, she couldn't listen to any music, and, and so she rebelled. And she said, I had no childhood. So that's not preparing your kids for the real world. I like what Jonathan said, he said, teach your kids the heart of God, not legalism, right? And so we want to be the salt 
of the earth. Our goal as Christians is not to isolate, but to infiltrate and impact culture without being compromised by it. Let me say that again. Our goal as Christians is not to isolate, but to infiltrate and impact culture without being compromised by it. It's a tricky balance. Uh, Jesus put it this way in John 17. In his prayer to the Father, he said, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one, and I am sending them into the world. Wow. Jesus is saying, I'm sending you into the world. So we're effectively living behind enemy lines. As an old hymn says, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. It's important to remember that. So here's point number three. As Christians, we need to invade, not evade the culture. Invade, not evade. So we try to engage people, and they don't seem to be listening to us. And you may wonder why. You might say, hey, you know, I try to talk to people about Jesus and they just terminate the conversation. Okay, what did you say to them? Well, I saw this non-believer and I said, um, hey, uncircumcised Philistine. Okay, <laughs> there's part of the problem. Um, that's a good way to burn a bridge. Have you been washed in the blood, sanctified, justified, redeemed, and have you become a part of the body of Christ? And they turned around and walked away. They don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> you just told them to be washed in blood and get in some body, what? <laughs> we cannot assume that our listeners today understand what we're talking about. America in particular has never been more biblically illiterate than it is right now. Now I've been preaching 50 years and uh, people were more literate biblically when I started than when they are, uh, than they are today. And so I don't think we can assume that our listener understands even our terminology. We need to break things down, explain them, and try to find common ground with them and build a bridge to them. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 9.22, I try to find common ground with everyone so I can bring them to Christ. I do all of this to spread the good news. Another translation of that same statement of Paul goes as follows, I am voluntarily become a servant to any and all in order to reach a wide range of people, religious, non-religious, meticulous moralists, loose living immoralists, the defeated, the demoralized, whoever. That's a good translation. Jesus modeled this. He spoke to the woman at the well. She could be described as the loose living immoralist. And then he spoke with Nicodemus, a religious man, who we could call a meticulous moralist. Paul and Mars Hill spoke to a secular audience there in Athens, Greece, while Peter on the day of Pentecost spoke to a largely religious audience. But they were adapting to their situation. So here at Harvest, our objective is to reach as many people as we can through our church, uh, through our films, through our one minute messages. We want to reach unexpected people in unexpected places with an unexpected message. You know, uh, it's an amazing thing, these little one minute messages that we've started showing. And you see them on Fox News, you see them on CNN, and uh, they've reached over 500,000 people. And 41,000 people have responded and made a profession of faith and ask for a Bible. Can you believe that? 41,000. <laughs> Last reach through all of our media efforts combined, we reached well over a billion people, and that is not an exaggerated number. Uh, and so that's amazing. And the church didn't spend a penny on that, by the way. That's all been funded through people who believe in what we're doing and support it. So that, that's what we're trying to do, reach people with the message of the gospel. That's point number four. We need to bring them the message of the gospel. Now, <laughs> when you bring the gospel message, know this, it's powerful. Uh, that's why Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. And the word that he used for power is a word that means explosive, okay? Not everyone's gonna respond favorably to this message. Uh, in 2 Corinthians 2, Paul says, wherever we go, the Lord uses us to tell others about him. And it's like good news, like a sweet perfume. Our lives are like a fragrance 
But the fragrance is perceived differently from those who are being saved to those who are perishing. So to some it's a fragrance, to another, others not so much. You know, some people wear too much cologne or perfume. Am I right? Uh, how do you know who they are? They're usually sitting by themselves because <laughs> they come to church, all the seats around them are empty. If they give you a hug, you smell like whatever scent they were wearing two hours later. You smell like Chanel number no. five. And sadly, it was a guy. Okay, so, <laughs> but it's like garlic. You know, garlic is great when you're cooking, but it's not so great on your breath afterwards, is it? So when we live as Christians, for some it's a sweet fragrance, they love it. For others, they actually find what we say and do offensive. And so that's what Paul is saying, bringing me to point number five. Before I can effectively tell them, I must first live it. There's nothing worse than a hypocritical Christian. The world is looking for authenticity. They're looking for you to be real. We must be before we can effectively speak. We need to practice what we preach and we are to be salt. Let's go back to that statement of Jesus again. Verse 13, you're the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Now it's hard for us to understand what this means, but back in that day, salt was a valuable commodity. So valuable, in fact, that a Roman soldier would be paid in salt. Hence the expression, he's not worth his salt. So they valued salt in a great way, and salt has impact. And today, we season our food with it. Um, if you have a sore throat, you might gargle with some warm salt water. It has an antiseptic quality to it. But uh, what does salt do? Well, in that culture, it preserved. It preserved. Okay, so they didn't have refrigeration like we do today. They would rub salt into the meat to preserve it. And in the same way, we as Christians preserve. In other words, we stop the spread of evil by our mere presence. Why? Because we speak out against what is wrong. We speak up for what is true. You might say that we're sort of a preserving influence in the world today. You just wait until the rapture of the church happens and look at how the world will go. Well, I hope you're not around to see it because that would mean you miss the rapture. Now, some of you have never heard this word before, but the Bible speaks of an event that is coming when the Lord will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remaining shall be caught up. Caught up, it's the... Greek word harpazo, harpazo, that's translated to the word rapture. So we're caught up in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Jesus said two will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two are grinding at a mill, one is taken and the other left. Two are laying in a bed, one is taken and the other left. So here's how it goes. Here we are in the world being salt, stopping the spread of evil, keeping the lid on things in a way. And suddenly the Lord calls millions of people who put their faith in Christ to heaven. That is gonna allow the spread of evil to happen quickly. And the Antichrist emerges on the scene and the great tribulation period begins and you see how that could all break out quickly with the removal of the church. Well, salt not only stops evil from spreading, but it stimulates thirst, doesn't it? When something's salty, you want water. You go to the movie and you order popcorn. And by the way, why are there no longer milk duds in movie theaters? Have you noticed this? <laughs> uh, every theater I've been to, no milk duds. What's with the milk duds being gone? I've had to smuggle in my own. You ever smuggle stuff into the theater? Big bottle of water in your back pocket, milk duds, three course meal in a little wagon, you know? <laughs> it's because they charge so much for everything, right? You order a bag of popcorn, they have the tiny little micro bag, and then the next bag is huge, and then there's one that's the size of a trash can, but you get free refills. I don't want free refills. But then you're eating your popcorn that's maybe a little too salty, and you go back and ask, can I get some water? Um, we, we can't put it in cups, we're not allowed, but there's that drinking fountain over there. Come on, give me a break. But we'll sell you water. 
uh, 30 gallons for $100. <laughs> but when you're a salty Christian, in the best use of that word, you will stimulate in others a thirst for God. One of the greatest compliments people can pay to a Christian is when they ask, why are you the way that you are? But here's the problem. It's when we're not salty enough. Jesus says in Matthew 5, 13, if the salt loses its saltiness, what good is it? It's not good for anything. Not good for anything. Those are pretty heavy duty words. Years ago, we were traveling to Europe. We were speaking at some pastor's conferences and, and I bought something called a backpack stroller because Jonathan was a little guy and, uh, and I had to put him in a stroller and then I had a backpack to carry him around and I didn't want to take all of that hardware overseas. So I said, well, this is a great idea. It's one device that does both a backpack stroller. And I didn't test it out till I got there. And I opened this thing up and it was the worst design object of all time because you had to hold it up the whole time. There were no back wheels. So you're in the little stroller, but there's no back wheels, so you can't lay it down, so you just have to hold it. And I thought, this is impractical. And then when I put it on in the backpack form, the wheels dug into my back. So I discarded it. It was worthless, and we still, to this day, use that expression. We'll look at something that doesn't seem to be working, and we'll say, it's a backpack stroller, right? <laughs> A backpack stroller, an unsalty Christian. You know, people go and they order coffee. I, I would like uh, a lavender latte, uh, decaf, soy milk with extra syrup. Why don't you just go to 31 flavors, okay? <laughs> You're not even ordering coffee anymore. What is that? You know, you decaf. And there's decaf disciples, uncarbonated Christians, unsalty believers, and then you have no impact at all. Notice that Jesus says, first we are to be salt, then we are to be light. First you're salt, then you're light. Why is it given in this order? Well, first to salt, I have a preserving effect. I create in others a thirst for God, and then having acted as salt, I can function as light. And effectively, I earn the right to be heard. Well, I, I, you know what? I admire your life, a non-believer says. I look at your family. How do you raise kids like that? In this world today, they ask as their baby's looking at an iPad in their stroller. Or they're letting their kids behave in a crazy way with complete disrespect and total irresponsibility. Or, or they ask you, how can you have a smile on your face when you're going through the hardship you're going through? You know, so you've been salt, now you've earned the right to be light. And so you live it, then you speak it. Point number eight, light exposes the darkness. It exposes the darkness. It's funny how in the dark you can't find something, flip on the light and you find it. You're driving in your car at night and you're eating a burrito and you drop it and lose it. The next morning you turn the lights on, you find that burrito and the one you lost two weeks ago as well which by the way has become its own life form and has climbed up into your child's car seat and strapped itself in. So, But this is the thing, light shows you things you would not otherwise see. And in the same way, when a Christian is living as they should, their mere presence in a room changes the temperature. It changes the dynamic. Here comes the salty light bulb. Hey, how's it going? I mean, they're in the middle of telling a dirty joke and, and they're having a good time and all of a sudden you walk in and the conversation stops. I kind of like that. Here comes the representative of Jesus Christ. What's even worse is when you know the punchline to the joke. Be that salt. Be that light. Be that person that makes a difference. But don't expect a standing ovation. Uh, Jesus said, this is the condemnation. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And everyone who is evil practices evil and they hate the light. And they don't come to the light lest their deeds should be exposed. And that can happen without you even saying a word. Listen, few things are harder to put up with than a good example. Few things are harder to put up with than a good example. When you're a good example, it drives people crazy. They want to see you mess up. They want to see you fall short so they can say, 
hypocrite, right? You keep your light shining. And how does that light shine? It shines through good works. Listen, people don't care about how much you know until they know how much you care. You may win the theological debate and blow your listener out of the water. Yeah, you know what, you're, you're smart, you had the answers, but you're mean and I don't wanna talk to you anymore. But then you can be a loving person and help someone. Let me help you change your tire. L let me help you do this thing you need done. Let me assist you. And they go, wow, I really like this person. And their heart will open up to you. So we need to show people. And I think that Christians do this so well. Yeah, we want to preach the gospel, but we'll show our good works in practical ways as well. Through our church, Harvest Riverside, Harvest Orange County, and Harvest Maui. Uh, we've done so much in this last year alone. As last Easter was approaching, we gave away 1,500 Easter baskets for little children that had really nothing. We hosted a back to school event in partnership with in and out Burger and the Department of Education. It helped 6,000 people. We gave out 4,000 backpacks filled with things that children need and we provided Free dental care. We didn't do it ourselves. We had actual dentists do it. I want you to know that. It'd be frightening here. Right, let me do drill. You know, no, not that. And we, they were given haircuts by professionals. Again, people who volunteered their time. And they were given medical screenings. And they were given free burgers and fries from In-N-Out Burger. And then over on Maui, after the devastating wildfires, that destroyed so many homes and lives were lost as well. We were there offering food pallets filled with water, diapers, other necessities. We gave away hundreds of Bibles to people and, and prayed with hundreds of people and hosted events for families that were demoralized and devastated by the effects of that fire. We had an evangelism team go over and share the gospel and a hundred people made a profession of faith. We're all about showing it through good works. And it earns us. It earns us the right to proclaim the gospel. Point number 10, let your light shine like you were the only one in the world. Let your light shine like you were the only one in the world. Look at verse 13. You are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. You might underline in your Bible, you. He uses it twice. You are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. In the original, original language, it would imply you and you alone are the salt of the earth. You and you alone are the light of the world. Question, what kind of world would we live in today if every Christian behaved just as you do? How many would be attracted or turned off to the gospel? What kind of general opinion do you think people would have of Christianity if you were its sole representative? Now you're thinking, ah, that's kind of a lot of pressure, Greg. Hey, newsflash, you are its sole representative in your sphere of influence in some cases. You may be the only Christian some people know. And they haven't even told you this yet, but they're watching you. And not only are they watching you, they're hoping you slip up. But when you don't slip up, or if you do slip up, you apologize for it and own it, they say, eh, there's something different about that person. I have to keep my eye on them. You're being salt. You're stimulating the thirst. You're doing your job. Listen, there are five gospels. Greg, you're mistaken. There's only four. No, there's five, actually. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and you. You're the fifth gospel. You're the only Bible some people are ever going to read. They're literally evaluating Christ based on you. Oh, I can't handle that. Well, handle it. And do the best that you can. Because you and you alone are the salt of the earth. You and you alone are the light of the world. Christians are walking epistles written by God and read by men. So let's put this all together and wrap it up. Salt is valuable. It preserves. It stimulates thirst. Light exposes and shows us the way. We do this through good works and gospel proclamation. This is who we are in this culture. Now I'm asking you, are you doing it? We're in a political season right now. And 
We all should vote, by the way. Every Christian should register and vote. So important. And let's get real. There's no perfect candidates. No perfect candidates. You're gonna find flaws in every candidate out there. So I have to think of it this way. Are there positions, the things that they stand for, are these the positions that I hold as a Bible-believing Christian? If that's it, then sometimes you say, then I'm gonna vote for them, even though they're not perfect. But we need to register, we need to vote. But having said that, don't put your hope in political solutions. Don't. <laughs> Only God can change the human heart. Only God can turn our nation around. And that would require a spiritual awakening. We should all be praying for that. A.W. Tozer, a great writer from years ago, made this statement and I quote, Revival is that which affects the moral climate of a community, end quote. So you wanna see the morality of a community affected, then we need a spiritual awakening. Some would say, well, change society and you'll get better men and women. Effectively, Jesus says, change men and women and you'll get a better society. That's why our primary efforts at Harvest are focused on the gospel and the proclamation of it and calling people to Christ. That's the best thing I can do for the United States. But more importantly, <laughs> but more importantly, it's the best thing I can do for the kingdom of God and it's the only thing that I'm really called primarily to do. Listen, you and you alone make a difference. You have a part to play. I heard it once said, quote, I am only one, but I am one. I cannot do everything, but I can do something. And what I can do, I ought to do. And what I ought to do, by the grace of God, I will do. So be the salt and be the light. Now let me close. Some of you listening to what I'm saying are not believers, and you are actually living in darkness. We all are before we're Christians. We don't know it because, well, it's all we've ever known. The story is told from history of a castle-like prison in Paris known as the Bastille that was about to be destroyed in 1789. There was a prisoner who had been confined there for years in this dark, dingy place. And so he was released. And he came out of his dark prison cell and the light was so blinding, he turned back and said, I want to be kept in the prison. I want to die in this prison. I can't handle the light. And this is the problem, is you can become too comfortable in the dark. And some people are. You ever notice how bars are so often dark? Now, I spent a lot of time in bars. Really? Yeah, when I was a kid, living with my alcoholic mother, who seemed to live in bars. And I would sit around and wait for her to stop drinking so we could go home. But, uh, People living in darkness, they need the light turned on. And here's the problem. It's not that God will not forgive you, but it's that you could come to a point in your life where you would no longer want his forgiveness. The Bible says, harden not your heart if you can hear his voice. Every time you hear the gospel and don't respond to it in the affirmative, your heart gets a little bit harder. The Bible says, he who is often reproved hardens his heart and he will be cut off and that without remedy. Let me paraphrase that. You, you hear the truth, you say no to the truth, and your heart gets a little tougher. So some people say, well, I'll come to Christ on my deathbed. Okay. Are you sure you're gonna have a deathbed? For some death comes suddenly, without warning. They don't know that day is their last day. For others, yes, they get older or they get sick. And they know that death is coming and they're told by people to get their affairs in order so that they're ready to die. But you think those people are all open to the gospel? I would hope so, but I know some people, they live so long in sin, they're like that prisoner in that prison in Paris who's so used to the dark, they wanna stay in the dark. So it's not that you get to a point where God would not forgive you as much as you get to a point where you would not want to be forgiven, you see, because you've hardened your heart. The Bible says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. 
Let him return to our God who will abundantly pardon. Notice, seek the Lord while he may be found. Jesus is here with us right now. He said, when two or more gather together in my name, I'm there in the midst of them. He's here. And Jesus, who died on the cross for our sins and paid the price for every wrong we've ever done and then rose from the dead, stands at the door of our life and he knocks and says, if you'll hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. Here's my question. Have you ever asked Jesus to come into your life? This is what you need. This is what you've been looking for. And only you can open the door of your heart, so to speak, and ask him to come in. You have to admit you're a sinner. You need to turn from your sin. And you need to say, Jesus, help. Forgive me of my sin. Give me a fresh start in life. Fill that hole in my life that I've tried to fill maybe with fame or influence or money or relationships or possessions or whatever. Lord, I need you in my life and he will come into your life and he will change you. So we're gonna close now in prayer and I'm gonna give you an opportunity to believe in Jesus and walk out of here a different person than when you came in. So let's all pray. Father, I pray that you will speak to those that do not yet know you. I pray that your Holy Spirit will work in their hearts and show them their need for you. Turn the light on in their life, Lord. Let them see how much they need that light so they will no longer want to live in darkness and bring them to yourself, I pray now, in the name of Jesus. Now, while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed and we're praying, there are some of you here that want Jesus in your life. Listen, if you want Christ to come into your life, if you want him to forgive you of your sin, if you want to go to heaven when you die, if you want to fill that hole deep inside of you, if you want to be ready for the Lord's return, if you're ready to say yes to Jesus today, wherever you are, would you just lift up your hand and let me pray for you. Lift up your hand saying, I need Jesus today, and I'll pray for you. God bless you. Lift your hand up high where I can see it, wherever you are. You guys at Harvest Riverside, you can raise your hand there. Harvest Maui, the same. You guys watching at Harvest at home, you don't have to lift your hand, but you can pray this prayer I'm about to pray in just a moment and ask Christ to come into your life. Anybody else, you want Christ in your life? Raise your hand up, let me pray for you. God bless you, God bless each one of you. Now you that have raised your hand, pray this prayer after me. You can pray it out loud if you like. Pray these words, Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner, but I know that you're the Savior who died on the cross for my sin and rose again from the dead. I turn now from my sin and I choose to follow you from this moment forward. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God bless you.